Okay, so good evening, everyone. We are going to start with uh, questions. We have three questions for tonight, and already you have been given some uh, handout. So the first question comes from someone who says they are a beginner and they had not heard this term karmic path or path of karma before. And this person is requesting Geshe-la to please give some classific clarification, talk a little bit more about what is karmic path. Also, that person is asking whether karmic path is something that it applies only to the 10 non-virtuous actions and in particular to the mental actions. Okay, so we are going to clarify the difference between karma and karmic paths. But first of all, to say that karmic path is something that applies to non-virtuous actions as well as karmic actions. All right. So um, it is something that applies to, um, as we say, both of them. And it is not something that applies only to mental actions. Okay, so let's try to explain here what is the karmic path. So let's start with the three um, of the mind, which is covetousness, malice, and wrong views. Okay, uh, we're going to take covetousness as an example for the mental one. So we say that when we have covetousness at the time of the motivation, what we have is a particular wish, the wish to acquire the possessions of another person. These things belong to somebody else and you have the wish to take them for yourself. At the same time, concordant with that wish to acquire or take the wealth of others, there is a mental factor of intention that is present. That mental factor of intention that is present at that time is the karma of covetousness. All right. So if you go back, we say that the karma exists is a mental factor that exists at the same time as the motivation of covetousness. So if we now examine this motivation of covetousness, what happens is that gradually it intensifies it goes through five stages of becoming stronger and stronger so we engage what is called the um, application and then we come to the end to the conclusion of that the conclusion of that is that in your mind you have reached the conclusion that says i'm definite i am going to get that object that belongs to this other person when you reach that point of the final conclusion in your mind, this is the time when you establish the karmic path of covetousness. This is when we say that the actual karmic path is completed. Completed here means it is established. All right. At the same time, together with that, we have the um, mental factor of intention. The mental factor of intention that exists at the same time with that is karma. Okay, so we mentioned here mental factors. There are different classifications and different lists of mental factors. The most predominant one that talks about 51 mental factors. And within those mental factors, you will find, let's say, the six root afflictions. Then you will find secondary afflictions and so forth. And definitely covetousness, malice, and wrong views are specific cases of afflictions that belong into that group of mental factors. Okay. However, the intention that exists at the same time with them is not an affliction, right? So the karma is not an affliction. Okay. So that was by taking, looking at mental uh, and in particular, at covetousness. So let's look at a physical. So let's look at killing. So when we examine killing, we say that for killing to take place, we need to have four things. We need to have a basis, we need to have an intention, we need to have application, and we need to have conclusion. So in terms of the basis, 
I, if the action is killing, you need another sentient being that you are going to kill. In terms of the intention, within intention, we recognize two things. One is recognition. So you correctly recognize that that is that sentient being, right? And the other one is the motivation. And the motivation here is the wish to kill. Then following that, we have the application. So either through your body or your speech, you are going to engage the act of killing. So either you personally, physically is going to kill that other being, or you're going to give the order to somebody else to kill it, or perhaps you might use mantra with your speech to kill it and so forth. And then we come to the conclusion. The conclusion is when that other living being dies, so when actually the life is taken out of that living being, we have the conclusion. When we reach that very end where that other sentient being loses its life, this is the time where the karmic path of killing is established. And at the same time, the person who commits the killing, at, at that point, they establish the killing karma. Okay, the karma here has to be understood as uh, being uh, of two types. You can have karma that is form and karma that is awareness. Physical and verbal karma is considered to be a type of form, whilst mental karma is considered to be awareness. So at the very end, at the conclusion, when that animal is dead when the life leaves the body of that animal, we establish what is called revealing and non-revealing forms of karma. So that thing at the very end is both karmic path of killing and the karma of killing. However, um, the Earlier on, when we said, because we said you have the basis, then we said you have the intention. So at the early stage, when you have the intention to kill, at that point, you have karma. That intention is karma, but it is not karmic path because you're very early on. You're at the early stage of motivation. Okay. So the karmic path is only that which is established at the very end at the conclusion. Why do we call it karmic path? We call it karmic path because it is the basis where that intention or that motivation will enter, will engage. So that motivation to kill will engage something. And that thing is called the karmic path. Okay, so I guess you're saying, I hope this gave you an idea of the difference between the karmic path and the karma. But again, if it's still it's not clear, don't hesitate to follow up with some questions. Just take this, think about it. And if you need to ask more, ask more. Okay, the second question that we had came from uh, that teaching, the part of the teaching that was talking about the heaviness of karma. And we said we have heaviness in terms of the basis. And there was mentioned there that if you kill an animal that has a larger body, uh, there is bigger negativity because the body of the animal is larger. So the question is here, that if uh, for the sake of food, let's say we kill a large animal in order to feed 10, 20 people, such as, for example, a cow, as opposed to killing, let's say, many animals that have much smaller body, so let's say shrimps, yeah? So which one is heavier or more, um, yeah, heavier negativity? So Gishon was saying that this comment that is made in terms of the negativity being heavier if you kill an animal of a large body only applies if you are comparing one to one. All right. So if you ask the question, which one is big in negativity to kill one shrimp or to kill one cow? So because the cow has a bigger body, to and will experience more suffering we say the negativity is bigger if you kill the bigger animal 
So this rule applies only if you are comparing just one of each species, right? Uh, Gesha says, if the question is, which one is the negativity? Many shrimps versus one single cow, Gesha says, I, I can't tell you. I cannot calculate how much is the negativity of killing many shrimps or how many shrimps or how big are their bodies and so forth, okay? So uh, this Gesha says, I cannot answer. Okay. Yes. Okay, we come to the third question. It is a question about someone who is actually very interested in studying Buddhism. However, the family objects and creates obstacles. So it creates a bit of a problem every time the person wants to go and attend the teachings. So this person is asking how can they benefit their parents, like re reduce the amount of suffering and anxiety the parents have. And also is a bit worried about the karma that the the family is creating by criticizing the, the dharma and so forth so what would be appropriate in a situation like this so Geshe is saying first of all without knowing the situation of your family and yourself in detail it's not very easy to really give you specific advice of how to deal with your family i don't really know the situation however um you know, there are some general things that we can say. So, you know, for example, every time that you leave the house to go and attend a Buddhist lecture or a teaching, you don't actually have to tell your parents, I'm going to listen to a Buddhist teaching because they don't like or they don't have affinity for Buddhism. So there's no reason to aggravate the situation. You can avoid saying a lie by being skillful. So if they ask you where you are going, you can say, I'm going to listen to a lecture that will help me make my life meaningful, help me live an honorable and truthful and honest life, right? Um, um, where I can, my behavior will be a good and polite behavior. Okay, so actually this is the essence of Buddhism, but you don't need to use the label, the actual word Buddhism. Okay, so this avoid creating obstacles at the first level as you are trying to leave the house to go to the teachings, right? You don't need to say I'm going to Buddhist teachings. Just say I'm going to listen to something that will help improve myself. Okay, the second one in terms of how we can help other people. All right, so you know, you must have known this very famous uh, saying that it says the Munis do not wash away the sins, they do not remove negativities and obscurations with their hands. The way that they benefit beings is by teaching the truth. So, you know, other people have a lot of afflictions within their own mind and they experience a lot of suffering in their own mind, right? So the Buddha cannot remove this physically with his hand, cannot reach out and remove that. So how can we remove, how can we help people overcome their suffering? Well, you can actually speak to them and in a logical way, just say to them that, look, suffering is a result. It must come from a cause. Let's try to identify the cause because if we identify the cause, there are things we can do. We can change the cause of the trouble, the cause of the suffering, and this will bring about a change in the, the experiences that we have. So if that is, if you can, if you are able to give advice that is beneficial for their mind and they will find through experience that this is actually helpful, then this is something that they are most likely to follow. So this is how you can actually benefit them. Again, do not say that this is Buddhist advice. Just say, you know, in general, it makes sense if we look at the cause, try to change the cause in order to improve the result, okay? So this actually is the essence of Buddhism. Now, for the third part of your question, Okay, so um, it seems that from your past life, you have some imprints, some imprints that make you have affinity and have interest in Buddhism. So that's the good part. 
but also it seems that from your past life you have created some obstacles to pursuing your study of Buddhism. Okay, so you have the interest, but at the same time you have the obstacles. So um, what you can do is you can consider that you're not the only person who experiences this. There are a lot of people who have interest in following something, and in particular Buddhism, and at the same time they have obstacles in doing that. So just say, just pray and say, I hope that my experience somehow will help everybody else, will purify everybody else and remove the obstacles for everybody else who's in the same situation as me so they can be free from this experience and as for my parents uh, i pray that this dislike and this aversion they have for buddhism will be pacified will be removed and that they will not create negative karma through that so through your prayers you can approach this Okay, so let's uh, connect to where we, le we were last uh, time. Uh, we are looking at the teachings of the 10 paths of actions. And uh, within that, we have the principal teachings and the determination of the effects of actions. In terms of the, of the determination of the effects and actions, we have non-virtuous actions and their effects. We have the actual paths of non-virtuous actions. We completed those 10 non-virtuous paths of actions. And then we went into distinctions of weight. In terms of distinctions of weight, we have the weight of the 10 paths of non-virtuous actions. And then we have a brief discussion of the criteria of powerful actions. So in that criteria of powerful actions, we say that we have four we have strength in terms of the recipient. We have strength in terms of the support. We have strength in terms of the object. And we have strength in terms of the attitude. We have covered the first two. So we continue now with strength in terms of the object. Yes. Okay, so um, if uh, we look here at um, strength in terms of the object so we say we, for example you can offer different things uh, if you can offer material things or you can offer teachings of dharma so if you compare these two offering the teachings of dharma it's uh, an act that has more strength also offering your own practice instead of offering some material offering has more strength another way of looking at strength is examining or comparing the six perfections so for example practicing generosity has a center strength but practicing ethics has bigger strength than generosity practicing patience has even bigger strength than practicing ethics if we look at the six the practices of the six perfections as we move down the list the strength becomes bigger it intensifies another um, area where we find these degrees of intensity is if we look at the non virtuous actions of body and speech we start with killing stealing sexual misconduct and we go all the way down to idle gossip and we say the one at the top the earlier one is stronger so killing is stronger than stealing which is stronger than sexual misconduct and so forth yeah. the next one we're looking at strength in terms of the attitude so the attitude here refers to motivation so if you do something with strong faith that will bring about strength or if you do it with a motivation a pure motivation which has no attachment it has no um, hatred it has no confusion then that is a very strong motivation if you do something with the intention to reach nirvana so if you do it uh, motivated by renunciation that is a very strong motivation. If you do it influenced by bodhicitta, then that is an extremely strong motivation. So even if you create a very small root of virtue, that root of virtue will be excellent, will be very strong due to the strength of the attitude. 
So to give you an example how an action can become very strong due to the strength of the motivation or the attitude, and we mentioned here bodhicitta being influenced by bodhicitta motivation, the Buddha has said in the Sutra, or the Heap of Jewel Sutra, that if all the living beings in the universe of the three billion world system, each one of them were to make a stupa of the Buddha as large as Mount Meru, and each sentient being were to pay reverence to this with all their actions for 10 million eons. Obviously, they would accumulate a vast amount of merit. But he says, compared to that merit, the merit that a bodhisattva accumulates by throwing or tossing one single flower up in the air as an offering to the Buddhas with the bodhicitta motivation, the merit that this bodhisattva creates is far greater than the previous case. So we have uh, completed this section, which is a brief discussion of the criteria of powerful actions. And we say that we can have uh, powerful actions due to, in terms of the strength, in terms of the recipient, strength in terms of the support, strength in terms of the object, and strength in terms of the attitude. It is very good to be aware of those things because this is something that we can actually see how we can implement in uh, the practice of our Lam Rim. So we have explained here, we have started explaining how to build up a day or a session of practice of the Lam Rim. And the first thing that we do at the beginning of the practice is to adjust the motivation. So if we can establish a motivation that says, I am not at all attached to the glories of samsara and I'm seeking for renunciation. And on top of that, if we can generate um, the mind of bodhicitta, then whatever we will be doing will be influenced by this motivation and it will, be it will have the strength due to the attitude. Then we say, as we begin the practice, we begin with the preliminaries. We do the six preliminary practices. And what we do there, we go for refuge. We engage in the seven limb prayer. We present those together with the mandala. And in that case, we have the strength due to the recipient, due to the field, right? Because we're doing all this in relation to the gurus and the Buddha and the Buddhas and so forth. Then if we look at the practitioner who is engaging these practices, if the practitioner is a lay person, if they have uh, vows of individual liberation, or if the practitioner is an ordained person and they have the vows of ordination, then the practice becomes very strong uh, due to the power of the support, which is the vows. And finally, we say that what we do is that we offer that practice, right? So the, it becomes very strong in terms of the object because we, it is dharma and it is dharma practice. So if we can get all these four in place correctly, already from the preliminaries, the actual part and the final part of the dedication, it will be extremely strong. Okay, we come now to the next. The next is a presentation of the results, of the effects. So we talked about the 10 non-virtuous karmic paths. We talked about the differences in terms of the weight or the heaviness. And now we want to look at the results. So in terms of the results, for each one of the 10 karmic paths, we identify four results. The first one is the maturational result. The second one is result concordant with the cause that is further subdivided into two. And the last one is environmental results. So we end up with four results for each. So let's look at the first type of result, which is the maturational result. So um, let's look at an example, example of killing, right? So there are different types of killing that you might be doing. So for example, you could be killing every day or you could be killing most days. Or perhaps you've done killing only once, 
Okay, so obviously we have differences of weight here because killing that you do always is heavy killing. Killing that you do most of the days, but not every day, uh, is middling. And killing that you have only done once is small in relation to that. In addition to that, um, we can look at the motivation because we say that uh, this killing or any non-virtuous action is motivated by attachment, by hatred or confusion. And again, those attachment can be great attachment or middle income attachment or small attachment. And hatred, the same, can have different gradations and confusion can come in three sizes. And that will determine the strength of the motivation. So when we're looking at the maturational result, we say that the maturational result of a non-virtuous action, that it is big, is to be reborn in the hells. If we're talking about the maturational result of a non-virtuous action, that is middling, it's to be reborn as a hungry ghost. And if it is the maturation of the small non-virtuous action, it's to be reborn as an animal. Okay, so we move now into the second type of results, and this is results that are concordant with the cause. We say that we identify two types of this. We have results that are concordant with the experience and results that are concordant in terms of behavior. For each one of the 10 non-virtuous karmic paths, we identify those. So, for example, if uh, we look at the uh, results concordant with killing, you, if, if, it, you know, if we look at the maturational result, if it is heavy killing, you will be born in the hells. But once that karma is completed, you will take another type of rebirth, all right? So let's take, say now that you have taken another rebirth as a human. So in that new rebirth, you, as a result of killing, you will experience having a short life and a lot of illness. As a result of stealing, you will have limited resources and whatever resources you have, you will have to share with others. As a result of having engaged in sexual misconduct, it means that those who are around you, let's say servants or people who work for you, will not be trustworthy. So you cannot trust them. Uh, they do unpredictable things. And also, let's say your spouse will be unruly. Okay, so these are the results uh, that concord with the cause. We continue with the four that are related to the speech and we want to see the um, experience that we would get from that. So first of all, as a result of lying, others will slander you, it means they will criticize you quite a lot and they will deceive you. So that's the experience you get from lying. As a result of divisive speech, those who work for you would not get along. So you will not have harmony in that environment. And also they will behave in a really bad manner. As a result of offensive speech, you will hear a lot of unpleasant and quarrel quarrelsome speech, meaning you will not hear anything pleasant, right? Er everything that reaches your ears will be unpleasant and harsh. The result of senseless speech is that um, your words are not reliable. And when you speak, other people do not understand you. They do not comprehend what you say. And also, you do not have confidence when you speak. So let's look now at uh, the results that we get that are concordant with experiences that come from the three mental poisons. So as a result of covetousness, you would have great attachment and you will have no contentment. So you always want, but you're never satisfied. As the result of um, malice, um, you are pursuing activities that are actually harming others. They are not benefiting others. And in terms of what you receive is you do not receive help from others. People don't want to help you. 
as a result of wrong views yourself you would have bad views and also uh, you will be a deceitful person. Okay, so you can see that we have this presentation. In other texts, there is a more straightforward presentation. And they say that the results that we get uh, where we have similar experience with the cause in terms of having uh, covetousness is that you will have a lot of attachment in your next life the experience that you have from having a lot of malice is that you will have a lot of anger in your next life. And the result of wrong views is that in your next life, you will have a lot of confusion. We actually can see quite a lot of examples of uh, these experiences that are concordant with the causes. So we see, for example, that a mother is giving birth to a child and the child dies at birth, so a very short life. Or you see the child, perhaps they survive birth, but they die at a very young age as a toddler. Or you see someone who does not die very early, but they have in general, they have a short life. And for the whole duration of their life, they are bothered with a lot of illness. It's like they're sick all the time. So we see examples of that. We see other examples of people who seem to be poor all the time. No matter what they do, they are impoverished. And even in the rare occasion where they get something, um, it is stolen from them, like a thief takes it away from them. Or you see other people who live in a country where there is famine and they die due to starvation. So these are results that are concordant with the cause. We see the results that are concordant with the cause of having practiced sexual misconduct. You see in some families, there is like complete lack of trust between the two partners. So that is totally unstable. Or that you see that someone has married someone else or is in a relationship and someone else comes and takes away their partner, right? And then they suffer, of course, greatly because of that loss. We see other people who are, seem to be a magnet for criticism, no matter what job they do, and even when they do their job, their job well, they are criticized all the time. Or we see other people who trust their partners, let's say, and then they are deceived in, you know, exploited, deceived and so forth in the most um, shocking way. So we should recognize all this as being results of um, uh, negativity through the speech. Uh, we see some people who experience uh, disharmony. So initially they have some friends, they have some relatives, they have some connections. And then it seems that everything goes, you know, really bad and there is disharmony. Or then you see that they, even if they employ some servants to help them do something, the servants misbehave and, and they don't listen. So this is the result of having engaged this divisive speech. We see other people who actually, they lose their financial independence and they have to go as servants and work in somebody else's household. But they end up in a household where, let's say, the boss of the house is bossing them around all the time and is criticizing them, never praising them, never giving them a, um, you know, a break, always talking in a very harsh manner to them. Um, or at other times we find, let's say, one family losing, again, its financial independence, having to come, like, socially, in a, become lower status, coming under another family who is more powerful, more predominant, and that more powerful family, more powerful family is always criticizing the lower family. When you see things like that, these are the result of having used offensive speech in the previous life. Mm. 
we see some people who, even when they tell the truth, they are not believed. Other people do not believe. what They, they don't want to listen what they say. Or they speak, but no one seems to take interest or show any respect towards what they say. These are the results of uh, having engaged in idle gossip. Now, we say that when we're looking at results that are concordant to the cause, we can have two ways of uh, being concordant. One is in terms of the experiences, and this is what we explained now. Uh, but also we say that there is concordance in terms of behavior. And when we say here concordance in terms of behavior, it means that you will favor the behavior with which you have most fami familiarity. So, for example, if you have done a lot of killing in your previous life, you will come into the next life and you will have a tendency for killing. If you have done a lot of stealing, you will come and you will engage stealing again. If you have done a lot of sexual misconduct, you will be very interested in sexual misconduct. They say that if you really understand these points of... Um, karmic causes and results, uh, you would be much more afraid of these results that are concordant to the behavior, even more than the maturational results. Because if, for example, you're born as a human and you have these tendencies, you like killing, you like stealing, you like sexual misconduct, you're going to spend your entire human life engaging in these activities. It means you will accumulate so much negativity that then as a result of that, you will go from one battery birth to the next. You will not see anything but lower migrations from that life onwards. So we see, for example, in young kids, we can see those tendencies. So you have some kids that from a very young age, they like to kill and they will kill small animals, insects and so forth. No one has taught them those things. They have not seen actions like this. It's like from their own side they engage in killing. We have other kids that are very interested in stealing from a very young age. And um, actually, they're very good at it. They're very good thieves. Other kids are very good at lying, and they're very good at telling lies. Actually, you can see in that these tendencies at a very young age, they come from imprints they have placed in their previous lives. Okay, so in terms of the results, we have talked about maturational results. We have talked about results concordant with the cause in terms of behavior and in terms of experience. And we come now to the fourth type, which is the environmental results. So for each one of the 10 non-virtuous actions, there will be specific environmental results. So the result of um, killing what will happen is that the, in the external environment, the food and the drink and the medicine and the fruit and so forth will have very little strength. They will not be nutritious. They will not be effective. They will have little power and little potency. Or they will be very difficult to digest. So whatever the people try to eat in order to get nourishment or medicine in order to support themselves, they will not derive that support for their life. Let's look at the environmental results that come from stealing. The results from that is that, let's say, the crops and the fruit and so forth will not develop, will not ripe. You will find that they will shrivel and die. So, you know, in some places, suddenly you might have frost or that will destroy the crop, or you might have intense heat that will cause all the fruit to dry up. Uh, these are actually the results of um, stealing, so everything will be spoiled. Then we have the environmental effects of sexual misconduct, and these are that the place where you are will be a filthy place, like there will be filthy substances like mud and urine and feces, and the smell will be a very foul smell. Uh, so everything would be unclean and also 
it will not be like a safe place or a nice place to be. These are the results of sexual misconduct. Yep. All right, okay, so uh, let's look now at the environmental results that come from lying. Uh, the result is that any work that you undertake in the fields or with a boat or with a car and so forth. So basically, these are works that you would undertake in order to bring some improvement, right? Improvement in your, in your wealth, improvement in the environment and so forth. Uh, all of those things will fail you will not do well in any of those. Uh, the environmental results of divisive speech is that you will be in a place that is very bumpy, very uneven, very difficult to travel and so forth. So it's not a smooth place to be. So, you know, divisive speech is like harsh words. So it, uh, no. That's the divisive speech. Sorry, it will be uneven. Okay. The next one is offens offensive speech. Offensive speech directly translates as harsh words or sharp words. And the environmental result of this is that there are a lot of sharp items in the environment. So things like thorns or pieces of stone that are shards of stone that are very sharp. Um, or you will have large rocks or sharp stones and broken things around and so forth. Then the environmental results of idle gossip is that the fruit will not ripe at the right time or they will appear to be ripened, but in reality they will be unripened and so forth. So now we're looking at the environmental results of covetousness, malice, and wrong views. So the environmental results of covetousness is that all the great resources that you have, you observe that they declined. So year by year, month by month, day by day, everything that is an excellent resource seems to be going down, down. So that's the result of environmental result of covetousness. The environmental result of malice is that you find yourself in a place where there are many epidemics and also there is a lot of uh, upheaval in the sense of conflict and war and so forth. And the environmental result of wrong views is whatever is the principal source of your wealth, of your income, will disappear. Okay, so, so far we have covered the determination of the effects and their um, actions, in particular the non-virtuous actions and their effects, and we have uh, looked at the three major outlines in that the actual paths of the non-virtuous actions, then we have looked at distinctions of weight, and then we have looked at an exposition of the effects. In the exposition of the effects, we have looked at the four different effects, which is the maturational results, results that are concordant with the cause in terms of experience, results concordant with the cause in terms of behavior, and then we have the environmental results. Okay, so then after that, we have a presentation of the virtuous actions and the effects of those. All right, so now we come to the presentation of uh, virtuous actions and their results. And if you can actually correctly understand the nature and the results of the non-virtuous actions, it is not so difficult to understand what applies to the virtuous actions. So in that, first of all, we have a twofold classification. We have the virtuous actions themselves, and then we have the results of those virtuous actions. So in terms of the virtuous actions, First of all, we want to look at what, is, what are the 10 virtuous actions. The 10 virtuous actions are abandoning killing, abandoning stealing, abandoning sexual misconduct, abandoning lying, abandoning divisive speech, abandoning offensive words, abandoning senseless speech, abandoning covetousness, abandoning um, malice, abandoning wrong views. So for each one of them, we establish a karmic path. So let's see uh, at an example of that. So let's say an important guest is coming to home for dinner 
and you have to decide what you're going to serve for dinner. And there might be the thought that, you know, we have to kill an animal for uh, the dinner tonight. So first of all, the attitude is seeing the fault in killing and saying, you know, it is inappropriate. If I look at myself and that animal, um, actually is just that we have different shapes of bodies. However, both of us consider our life to be the most precious things to us. So this animal that I'm about to kill, consider it, it, its own life as being something very important, just as I do. It is inappropriate for me. It is not good for me to kill. So this is the intention or the attitude, which is ab seeing the fault in killing and abandoning this intention to kill. Next, we have the performance, and this is the activity of having correctly restrained yourself from killing it means you have abandoned killing you have stopped killing you're not going to kill anything and at the end we have the conclusion of the physical action which is completing that correct restraint so you're absolutely certain that you're not going to kill that animal you're not doing any killing when all those three are completed you can say that you have the karmic path completed so we have given here the example of killing and the virtuous action that comes from abandoning killing. However, not killing and abandoning killing are not the same thing. Abandoning killing, it means that actually the opportunity for killing has a reason and you have sat down and gone through this process of thinking because it takes effort. You have to look at this animal and you say, you know, this poor animal, it knows nothing. It doesn't know how to what to practice. It doesn't know how to abandon. And here I am that I'm looking for dinner. It's actually not correct for me to kill an, an animal in order to sustain my body, right? So you think about the negativity that comes from killing. You think about how this animal also considers their life to be so precious. And in that way, you develop the attitude, which is the motivation that wishes to abandon the act of killing. Then following that, you have to come into the actual application. The actual application is when you make the effort to restrain yourself from killing. And the conclusion comes when you have decided that definitely you are not killing. You're not going ahead with killing this animal. So as you can see, it takes some thought. It takes some effort. So to abandon killing is not the same as the opportunity or the need for killing never arose and therefore I never killed. Another example that we can see this very clearly is not stealing and abandoning stealing. Not stealing might happen because you didn't get the opportunity. You didn't get tempted or, you know, you didn't see somebody else's money lying around and so you didn't steal. But abandoning stealing is a different thing. First of all, you have to develop the motivation, which is the attitude. And the attitude must be this thinking process that sees the fault uh, from uh, having attachment and accumulating wealth. And you say, you know, there's actually suffering involved with accumulating wealth. First, you have to amass it, then you have to protect it, then you have to find means of increasing it. You will always be worrying about it. For the sake of accumulating wealth, I will end up in the lower migrations. Like, who wants to have wealth? So you develop the attitude not to accumulate wealth. Then you come into the actual part where you actually make effort to restrain yourself from stealing. And finally, you have to the, come to the conclusion where you decide you do not want to steal. So this is how abandoning stealing comes about. And apply the same thing with to abandoning uh, sexual misconduct, abandoning the wrong speech, and so forth. Okay. 
Okay, so now let's look at the results of those uh, 10 virtuous actions. Again, we are going to have the three types of results, such as the environmental results, results concordant with the cause, which again are subdivided into two. Uh, first, the maturational, then results concordant with the cause, and then the environmental results. So for the first one, the maturational results, as we did before, here also in the 10 virtuous actions, we identify big virtuous actions, middling uh, size virtuous actions, and small virtuous actions. The maturational result of a small virtuous action is to be reborn as a human. The maturational result of a middle virtuous action is to be reborn as a god of the desire realm, and the maturational result of the great virtuous action is to be reborn as a god of the form and formless realm. Then when we come into results that are concordant with the cause or the environmental results, you can understand those by looking at the opposites of those that we had with the 10 non-virtuous actions. So in terms of results that concord with the cause in terms of experience, the, these results in terms of abandoning killing is that you will have a long life and you will be free from illness. So it's the opposite of killing, which is having a short life and having a lot of illness. The experience that you will have um, that concords with the cause of abandoning stealing is that food and drink and medicine will be very abundant. You will have as much as you need and also they will be potent. It's exactly the opposite of what we had before with stealing where those things became very scarce and also they didn't have much power to support you. Okay, so I guess I would like uh, to go back and uh, just clarify one uh, issue. When we were talking about the results that come from killing, we say, of course, that we have the maturational result and then we have the result that is concordant with the cause and finally we have the environmental result. So, in, okay, the maturational result was clear. Then uh, concordant with the cause, we say we have two. We have behavior and we have experience. Behavior is easy, right? You will have a liking for that thing to repeat again. In terms of the experience, the experience, the resultant experience of killing is that you will have a short life and a lot of illness. Then in terms of the environmental result is that food and drink and medicine will have little power to support your life. So Gesho said, you know, he mixed it a little bit uh, with uh, the, the results of killing, with the results of stealing, where resources actually become very scarce. Okay, so here we're talking about the results of the virtuous action of abandoning killing. And if you look at the result that um, is in accordance with the experience is that you will have a long life and you will have very little illness. And in terms of the environmental result is that the food, the drink and the medicine will be very potent. So we, up to here, we have completed the presentation of black and white karma. We talked about non-virtuous uh, actions and virtuous actions and the results. It is actually very important to understand those properly and develop the faith of belief, the conviction that comes with thoroughly understanding those issues. Because if you do not have an understanding, if you're not convinced, convinced about the law of cause and effect, then uh, uh, this totally undermines your faith. And that means that then whatever texts you will engage, whether they are texts on Sutra, whether they are texts on Tantra, you will be viewing them with, uh, let's say, lack of faith, uh, with uh, almost like suspicion, and you will not derive any benefit from those. 
However, if you do develop correct understanding um, of the law of cause and effect, and if you generate that faith of belief in that, that will make you to work quite hard to build up your um, the two types of accumulation. And uh, you will do prayers, you will do petitions to your guru and so forth. And from that point onwards, you will proceed. There are various texts that give a very good presentation of the issue of the law of cause and effect, such as, for example, the levels of yogic deeds, the compendium of determination, the Abhidharma, and so forth. And these are texts that you should consult in order to have a thorough presentation, understanding of the law of cause and effect. Okay, so it is like this. Uh, we have given a presentation of black and white karma. When it comes to negative black karma, it is important that such thoughts do not even arise in your mind. So don't entertain these thoughts. But even if it happens due to afflictions, strong afflictions, that such thoughts arise in the mind, it is very important to stop your body and speech from engaging in these actions. Recognize, remember that these are non-virtuous actions. You don't want to engage them. And even for whatever reason you're carried away and you actually engage those non-virtuous actions, it is very important to recognize it with your conscientiousness straight away, generate strong regress and confess it as quickly as possible. Right, so remember that the result of this will be to be born in the hells and lower migrations and all those things that we explain. So confess and regret it. When it comes to virtuous actions, think about those things as much as you can every day. Not only think about them, but allow your body and your speech to engage in virtuous activities as much as you're capable of doing. And whilst you engage in those activities, do it enthusiastically with a lot of determination, having a re clear recollection of the benefits of virtue. And at the end, do all the dedication prayers and rejoice and so on and so forth. Actually, this is the way to have a meaningful life, make every period, every day, every period of 24 hours a day meaningful by extracting, the, making this the essence, the core of your practice. So we stop here for tonight. Sorry, we went about four or five minutes over. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>